What is guilt? Well, there are two main definitions of guilt. The first is the fact of having committed a breach of conduct, especially violating law and involving a penalty. And this can range from anything from uh, breaking the speed limit to stealing someone's property. But today I'm more concerned with the second definition of guilt. That is a feeling of deserving blame for offenses. Uh, I've always wondered if people feel guilt the same way. For me personally, it's more of a pins and needles in my chest, a, a weight, or a lump in my throat. You may experience it a little differently. Now, uh, guilt can be a, a good thing because it leads a person to Christ. In fact, a person cannot become a Christian unless they experience guilt. And then this guilt is this acknowledgement of our sins against God. For Paul writes in Romans chapter 3, verse 23, For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And this acknowledgement of sin, this guilt, motivates us to do what is right. As Paul also writes in 2 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 10, For the sorrow that is according to the will of God produces repentance without regret, leading to salvation. Now this concept, this feeling of guilt, develops around the ages of three, four, or five years old, and it's something that is encouraged by your parents. For example, when you do what is right as a child, your parents, they reward you emotionally. They, they say that they're proud of you uh, verbally. They, they encourage you to do other behavior, and sometimes they might even reward you physically, maybe something as simple as a dessert or a special gift you want. Of course, they do the opposite when you act up. They might discourage you emotionally. No, nothing bad about that. Just letting them know that they're disappointed. And it, it's not a good feeling to have your parents disappointed in you. Or they might discourage you verbally. They might give you a very long lecture about what you did. Or they might discipline you physically. They might spank you. And of course, that's not fun for the kid. It wasn't fun for you. It wasn't fun for your parents. It's not fun for everyone else in the grocery aisle when you're getting spanked. But... It produces a good citizen, and hopefully it will produce a good Christian. Now, eventually, as you get older, guilt functions on its own. You don't need to be rewarded by your parents. You don't need to be discouraged by your parents. It functions naturally and normally. And occasionally, we make mistakes. Occasionally, you might do something wrong. You might say the wrong thing. You might hurt someone physically or emotionally, maybe even intentionally. And you feel this, this pain, typically in your chest or your throat, or perhaps in your mind, and it weighs on you until you correct what you, did, well, correct what you did. Now, this is a good thing, because a Christian is supposed to have a soft heart, and this soft heart motivates them to do what is right. And it seems Christians overall are pretty good at feeling guilty. But it seems, unfortunately, that some Christians are perhaps too good at feeling guilty. Though they have a penitent heart, Though they have repented of their sin, though they have confessed it to their brethren, to God, and though they have made it right with the individual they have wronged, they still feel that feeling of regret, that feeling of guilt that lingers sometimes for years at a time. And some might not see this as a big deal. They might see this as a good thing because if you feel bad all the time, that's going to keep you from doing other bad things, right? That might be true to maybe some degree, but... On the other hand, it robs you of the joy and the peace you're supposed to have as a Christian. I remember uh, two distinct conversations uh, I had at uh, the Southeast Institute of Biblical Studies. One particular, on one particular occasion, me and my fellow students, we were, help, we were helping out with a door-knocking campaign. And some people of the local congregation were giving advice. And there was this one really nice lady that said something profound. She said, whenever I knock on someone's door to share the gospel with them, I do it with a smile on my face because I want them to know how happy I am that I am a Christian. And when I heard that, I was like, wow, that's pretty profound. Why haven't I thought of that? Shouldn't that be obvious? Shouldn't our happiness and our joy be synonymous with our faith? But often they're not, at least for some people, they're not. Another conversation I had was with my friend David Lee. David Lee is an excellent Christ, Christian and preacher, and both of our wives had to uh, participate to some degree in the program we were in. And while they were in their classes, we would go to the library, we'd bring our books and our laptops, and, uh, laptops, and hopefully we were 
uh, planning to chip away at our syllabus, but we would normally end up having conversations. Sometimes it was about scripture, sometimes it was about hypothetical moral situations that would never take place, and uh, sometimes we would talk about preaching. And we noticed how certain preachers preach a very negative gospel, where all they talk about is false denominational doctrines, where all they talk about is the people that are going to hell, and, and there's times for those kinds of sermons. But he said something that really stuck out to me. He said, if we're not preaching a gospel that brings peace to people, we're doing something that's fundamentally wrong. And Christianity should bring peace and joy to people. But it seems that, unfortunately, though many people are good Christians, some still hang on to guilt, regret. The sins that they've committed in the past, though they've repented, it's still as though they live their lives like they never changed at all. They're still hanging on to the guilt. So maybe we can overcome this issue if we first realize how God sees us and how God does see the sins of our past. So how does God see us? We know that once upon a time, we lived a life separate from God. There came an age where we became accountable for our own actions and we chose to sin against God. And at that time, as Paul says in Romans chapter 5, verse 10, we were enemies of God. As he says in Colossians chapter, 1, verse, uh, Colossians chapter 1, verse 21, that we were once alienated from God, hostile in mind, engaged in evil deeds. And there's one other passage I want to look at, and that's Ephesians chapter 2, if you will turn with me there. Ephesians chapter 2, and let's look at verses... 1 through 3. And you were dead in your trespasses and sins, in which you formerly walked, according to the course of this world, according of the prince of the power of the air, of the spirit that is now working in the sons of disobedience. Among them we too formerly lived in the lust of our flesh, indulging in the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature children of wrath. What we were before God was not pretty. We lived in opposition. Our aims and our objectives and our reasons for living were inconsistent with what he desired for us. But God has done so much to take us from where we were to get us to where we are today. If you will turn with me to Romans 8, the passage that Brandon just read, Romans chapter 8. Romans chapter 8, verses 15 through 17. For you have not received a spirit of slavery leading to fear again, but you have received a spirit of adoption as sons by which we cry out, Abba, Father. The Spirit himself testifies with our spirit that we are children of God. And if children, heirs also, heirs of God and fellow heirs with Christ, if indeed we suffer with him, so that we may also be glorified with him. Though we were once enemies of God, God gave us a spirit of adoption so that we might be his children. Now why is adoption such a beautiful thing? Well, if you have kids, imagine your kids, for example. Imagine the first time you realized that you were going to be a parent. Instantly, in that moment, you loved your child unconditionally. You may have been terrified, but you loved your child unconditionally. Typically, it's a little bit easier for the mother because she's carrying the child for nine months. It's a little bit easier for men typically to conceptualize their love for their child once they see it and they, they hold it. But you love your children. And you don't have to give some logical, analytical reason as to why. You simply do. And there is nothing you would not do to keep them safe, to protect them, to bring them up and give them everything life has to offer because you love your children. Now, we all love the children here, but you're partial to your own. Of course, you care for the other children here, but they're not your kids. So what is, so what, what is beautiful about adoption is, is you take someone who's not your kid, someone whom you owe nothing, and you make them a part of your life. 
though they are not entitled to anything from them, you treat them as though they were your child, and you make them your child. And that's exactly what God did to us. Though we were his enemies, though we lived a life separate from him, he took us and made us his children. Another thing to consider about adoption is, why do people typically prefer to adopt babies? Well, babies are easier. You can start bonding with them at a, at a young age. You can sort of shape them into the people you want them to be. It gets difficult when you uh, adopt a child who's five, eight, ten years old. Because to no fault of their own, they've incurred some baggage because of the experiences they've had to deal with. And you hop right into their life and you have to help them work through it. And it's a very difficult thing. And that's why many people simply are not able to do so. But God doesn't care how we come to him, and what I mean, I don't mean that we, we don't have to repent or, or, or change our lifestyle. But God doesn't care if you're 12 years old on the cusp of accountability and you've technically only committed one sin against him. Or if you're 90 years old and you've lived your entire life in rebellion to God. Wherever you are today, God is willing to make you his child to give you a spirit of adoption so that you can cry Abba Father now that word Abba is interesting it's the Aramaic word for father it sounds similar perhaps to mama or dada wouldn't you say so there's a funny thing that we as humans do we don't call our parents by their names I never called my mother Mona I never called my father Mark. In fact, people of every culture have a special name for their parent. And ironically, they're very similar. Across many different cultures and many different ages, most people have the, the same name for their father or their mother. Take Chinese, for example. The word for mother there is mama. In Hindi, it's ma. In Afrikaan, it's ma. In ancient Egyptian, it's a little different. It's mutt, but pretty similar. In Swahili, it's mama. This is also true for what we call our fathers. The word papa can be found in several different languages, such as Russian, Hindi, English, Spanish, and with variations in German and, and Swedish. Now, why across all these different cultures and languages do we have roughly the same name for our parents? Well, this is the theory that perhaps can explain this. Children, regardless of what culture they're born into, they use the exact same sounds to learn how to speak. And so what researchers have suggested is that parents of cultures in the past have picked the easiest syllables and made a name for themselves, such as mama, papa, dada, or in the case of Palestine, Abba. So some scholars have suggested that Paul is painting a very intimate picture of the relationship we have with God. Though we were not his child, he makes us his child so we can cry out to him as our father. Abba, Father. It's a beautiful picture of God making someone who's not his child, his child. We are no longer seen as his enemies, but his children. And though we acknowledge that, and though we know that God has made us his own, I still know many Christians who struggle with guilt, who struggle with the sins of their past. Well, now that we see how, how God sees us, let's consider how God sees our sin. If you will turn with me to Ezekiel chapter 18. Ezekiel chapter 18 now, of course, this is a passage we, we commonly use uh, to combat doctrines like original sin and total depravity. But there's a little bit more we can gather from it. Ezekiel chapter 18. Now, I'll give just a little bit of the context so we can understand what's going on. Uh, there's a time in Israel's life where they're 
in captivity. They're in a land that is not their own. And they have this proverb or the, this catchphrase, uh, something we really don't say nowadays, but it goes something like, uh, you can find it in verse 2, the fathers eat the sour grapes, but the children's teeth are set on edge. Basically what they're saying is uh, our parents ate these really sour tart grapes, and yet our mouths are sour because of it. They were saying this in reference to God. Basically, our parents were really bad people. They sinned a lot. They messed up. And God is punishing us for it. Well, God, he, he really didn't like that. He said, I, I don't want you to ever say this proverb again. And he goes on this, this, this long explanation of how he judges people individually based off their own righteousness and their own wickedness. And the first example he gives, gives is of a, of, a, of a man who does everything right. He worships God. He doesn't worship idols. He gives to the poor and needy. He does everything right. And then he talks about his son. Read with me verses 10 through 13. Then he, became, then he may have a violent son who sheds blood and, and who does any of these things to a brother, though he himself did not do any of these things. That is, he even eats at the mountain shrines, that is, pagan altars, and defiles his neighbor's wife. He oppresses the poor and needy, commits robbery, does not res, uh, restore a pledge, but lifts his eyes to idols and commits abominations. He lends money on interest and takes increase. Will he live? He will not live. He has committed all these abominations. He will surely be put to death. His blood will be on his own head. God goes on to describe this man who, who does everything wrong. Anything he could possibly do wrong, he does. He hurts people. He robs. He steals. He uh, takes advantage of the poor. Need. Everything he does, he does wrong. And yet, look what God is still willing to offer him. Jump down with me to verse 21. Starting at verse 21. But, the wicked man, but if the wicked man turns from all his sins which he has committed and observes all my statutes and practices, justice and righteousness, he shall surely live and not die. And all his transgressions which he has committed will not be remembered against him because of his righteousness when he, which he has practiced. He will live. Do I have any pleasure in the death of the wicked, declares the Lord God, rather that he should turn from his ways and live? Jump down with me to verse 32. For I have no pleasure in the death of anyone who dies, declares the Lord. Therefore, repent and live. God has no pleasure in the death of the wicked. In fact, we find from 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 9, the Lord is not slow about his promise as some count slowness, but is patient toward you, not wishing for any to perish, but for all to come to repentance. Basically, the reason God has waited 2,000 years to return and is still waiting is because he's patient on those who need to repent. Because as he says in, the, in Ezekiel chapter 18, he would rather show mercy and compassion than exact vengeance. We see that God is willing to forgive. But not only is he willing to forgive, he's willing to forget. Now I'm sure we've all heard people say, well I'll forgive you, but I won't forget. It's not a very godly attitude, is it? For us as humans, forgetting is something that is very difficult to do. In fact, our survival instincts are built around remembering really bad things that happen to us. When you're a child and you put your hand on the stove, it burns you and it hurts you, and you catalog that memory away, reminding you, stay away from the oven. Or when you're outside playing and a wasp stings you and your hand swells up and you realize you're allergic and you have to go to the hospital. It's a negative experience. You catalog that away so you know not to mess with wasps. Well, this bleeds over into our relationships. If someone wrongs you, someone hurts you, someone brings a negative experience into your life, you're going to catalog that memory away and say, I don't like this person. I'm going to stay away from this person. But that's really difficult when they seek your forgiveness. 
when they want to be forgiven. And you know, as a Christian, you have an obligation to forgive them because God has forgiven you of all your sins. Not only has he forgiven you, he's forgotten them. And that sort of works counterintuitive to how we work. It's hard for us to forgive, and it's hard for us to forget. But as a Christian, we forgive them. And maybe you can't forget it right now, but at the very least, you treat that person as though they never sinned in the first place. But God, he doesn't have this issue. This is not difficult for God. When God forgives you of your sins, he forgets it. Now, some say he, he, wipes, your, he wipes his memory. That, that's not true. God doesn't technically forget anything. But he treats you as though you never sinned in the first place. And instead of seeing you and your sin, he sees Jesus and his blood. He no longer holds you accountable for your sins. They've been dealt with. The debt has been paid. Imagine that you have just paid off credit card debt or a student loan that's been bothering you for a long time, do you look back on that debt or that loan and say, man, I really hated that I owed all that money on that credit card or, or on that loan that I borrowed? No, you forget all about it. You're happy. You're free. The debt has been paid. It no longer comes to mind. Think about how Paul lived out his Christianity. Paul says in 1 Timothy 1.15, it is a trustworthy statement deserving a full acceptance that Jesus Christ came into the world to save sinners among who I am foremost of all. Some translations say, of whom I am chief. Paul is saying, I was the worst guy. I was the worst sinner. I did things you guys have never done and hopefully will never do. Well, why was Paul so bad? Well, he says in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 9, uh, I am the least of the apostles and not fit to be called an apostle because I have persecuted the church of God. Now, brethren, there is nothing in this world more precious to God than me and you. I'm not saying that out of vanity or pride. But God has given up so much so that he could have you as his child. He has given his only son so that you could be his child. You're precious to God. And Paul was trying to take that away. Notice what he says in Acts 26. If you want to flip over uh, there, you can. Acts chapter 26, verses 10 through 11. Paul says, And this is just what I did in Jerusalem. Not only did I lock up many of the saints in prison, having received authority from the chief priest, but also when they were being put to death... I cast my vote against them. And as I punished them often in all the synagogues, I tried to force them to blaspheme. And being furiously enraged at them, I kept pursuing them even to foreign cities. Now, Paul, he did a lot of bad things to Christians, but the one thing that sticks out to me is what he says in verse 11. I tried to force them to blaspheme. Now, we know for Christians, we would rather die than deny our Lord. That is the worst possible thing we could do. And many Christians in the early church had to give their lives for Christ. And yet, the worst thing we could possibly do, Paul was trying to make Christians deny the Lord who had saved them. Paul did a lot of bad things. But did he hang on to his guilt? Of course, I'm sure when he thought back to his past, there was some regret. But did he let that guilt rob him of the peace and joy that he had in his faith? No, of course not. Paul was a happy guy. Read some of his letters. Not the letters where he's yelling at people in the letters. The letters where everything is going right and he's happy about his brethren who are growing in the Lord when he himself is growing in the Lord. And he's, he's, having the, excuse me, he's getting the privilege to suffer for his Lord. Paul's the kind of Christian that can sing in a jail cell because he's happy. Because he has joy. Because he has Christ. Instead of hanging on to the past, he says in Philippians chapter 3, verse 14, I press on toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. 
Paul was not hanging on to the past. He let it go because that's what God did. And if God is willing to put our sins in the past, shouldn't we as well? Shouldn't we embrace the, the joy and the peace we have in Christianity? For as John reminds us in 1 John 3, 3, we are as pure as God is pure. The sins we committed, they're gone. They're no more. And if you're here today, and there is sin in your life, and you wish to have your slate wiped clean, we would love to help you with that. If you are here and you believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, and you're willing to repent of your sins and confess that He is the Son of God, we would love to baptize you. And through that, God will forgive you, and Christ will certainly add you to His church. And if there's anyone here who is perhaps once obedient to the gospel, but is no longer living in a manner pleasing to God, we would love to pray for you, and God will certainly forgive you. If there's anything we can do for you spiritually, please come forward.